It's backseat game design ranting time, my dudes. It's been a while, and I'm finally glad to unleash a pointless and uncalled for bit of free game design consultation onto the recently released strategy game Oriental Empires. It should also function as something of a review. Here's the short version. You won't believe this isn't a licensed spin-off of the Civilization franchise. It's Civilization. It's a less ambitious but more technical and deep version of Civ, with a specific focus on a single kind of civilization in a more limited timeline, made by this tiny team that's already proven their passion and skill to have output such a heavyweight game on their own. It's not Total War, and I say that mainly because I've seen people bringing up Total War in the context of this game. Its mechanical design has virtually no crossover with Total War, other than central elements of the genre. But visually, you could be fooled, since it sometimes looks like Total War in screenshots, but we'll get into that. The extent to which you'll like Oriental Empires should almost entirely be judged on how much you like Civilization games, or perhaps 4X games in general. Not really Total War games, but that's just my advice. So there's your little review <laughs> to get started. Now the long version. I'm going to walk you through getting into the game and going through the basic gameplay loop, and then talk about the core design choices for various central mechanics, and make snarky backseat comments on all the choices and details of it, the pros and cons. I should add that I got the game for free, so mentally add in a few extra jibes of your own to counter my bribery-based bias. The first thing you do is you pick a tribe slash early Chinese culture to play as. Now when you reach this menu, there are two non-mutually exclusive things you might suddenly start thinking. Number one, wow these Unity engine ass scroll bars are janky as fook, but unusually entertaining. That's your voice and your choice of words by the way. And number two, wait a minute. This isn't the Three Kingdoms era! <laughs> yes, it's the Oriental Empires from before they were empires, at least as the game starts, since technically the game vaguely represents a 3000 year progression in tech, up to about 1500 AD. It might just be Three Kingdoms fanboys like me, but whenever a game about empires existing in the Orient, such as this, appears, I'm always gunning for that Three Kingdoms theme. Alas, this game, being primarily a nation-building game rather than military strategy explicitly, wouldn't have worked at all if it stuck to a single time period. You need the time to allow all the upgrades and such to be unlocked as you go along. So I guess we'll just wait for Creative Assembly to make a Three Kingdoms Total War. Go on guys, do you have any idea how big the Chinese video game market is? I know you love money, just do it! Anyway. So back in this game, set in China, that isn't by Koei and puts much less focus on boobs than the market has grown used to, you pick which little group you start as, with a roster of passive buffs for each one. There's little replayability being injected there with all the different preferred styles, as you might imagine, but there's nothing worth getting all long dong over. So you start the game, and you're playing Civilization's illegitimate love child by a Caucasian man with a top knot in a selection of DVDs featuring Andy Lau and Takeshi Kaneshiro. So you know the drill. You have your hex grid, you move settlers to make cities in places, there's little resource flags, so the nearby hex has changed your colour, and you make farms on them to improve the stats of the city, and you raise military units to kill other military units, you steal cities from other players, and you repeat this until the game claims that you have won or lost. So now, let's get gritty, and by that, I mean boring. The Building System Here we hit difference number one from Civilization. The building system seems to have a quite different objective design-wise. As I've ranted about previously, the building system in Civ games is part of this grand orchestra of reward cycles that aims to constantly increment the player's power, with the UI making a big deal about how long you have until each new increment. To achieve that, you can just build everything everywhere, so you always have something on the go, always giving you that extra bit of an excuse to play, say it with me now children, ONE MORE TURN! But the downside to that design is the strategy element. 
Aside from build order, where's the strategy in making all settlements have all buildings? I've seen the same complaint raised by those criticising the older Total War games slash defending the newer ones. Ultimately, it's a design decision, and the best choice depends on what your game wants the players to feel. Oriental Empires goes for the more I want the player to feel clever route, not the I want the player to feel the gameplay is rewarding route. That former route is the hardcore route that sits best in strategy games, so you can take that off the game design checklist, put strategy in the strategy game. Tick! You did it! Specifically, as well as the building pool being somewhat limited by the time period restriction of course, you have to pay upkeep costs on many buildings which in the early game virtually prevents you accessing the building system at all. You have to carefully choose which buildings you want and where they'll be most useful because you ain't getting more than one granary in this country, son. Not unless you want no military, and you do want a military as everyone and their rhinoceros is trying to kill you out there. It also has a building slot limit, far below the number of buildings available. It's mitigated as the game goes on by letting you buy more slots in the form of settlement upgrades. But it means even if you're rich enough to afford lots of buildings at once, if you really wanted, you're still forced to strategically pick which buildings would suit each place best, which in practice just means deciding between military and economy as in so many games. Now this design, permanent punishments for having buildings and limited building slots, is very similar to the building system in Total War Rome 2 and Attila. And for the record, I am strongly against those building systems and completely reject all design arguments in their favour as pure insanity and I have personally murdered several people who defended it. Wait, hang on. Editor! Oriental Empires doesn't ruin my life though, as it's just so much more moderate and agreeable in the way it does it. The limits are less strict for starters, and it doesn't just render the whole building system actually unusable after a while. Plus, crucially, there's a nice bit of design that made it over from Civ that Total War lacks, which alleviates the issue greatly. That is the tile improvement system, an extension of the building system effectively. While you may not be making a core building all the time, or barely ever in fact, you can at least be looking forward to the effects of upgraded farms, roads, mines and other special buildings you can create outside of your towns. Most of these don't cost upkeep, so you can develop your nation safe in the knowledge that it's definitely getting better. I would argue it's not quite as fun to build the thing that makes archer units and pay upkeep on the building whether you use it or not as paying to have the option open feels like insurance payments, makes you feel like a sucker. Makes me feel like a sucker anyway, and I do suck, but that's an entirely different story. Time for a little aside to point out one little annoyance in this outbuilding system. You see, the people get angry and revolt if there isn't enough food. Now the people also get angry and revolt if you make them build farms. So there isn't enough food when a farm gets destroyed or something happens and the supply drops below the population level. The people get angry, but then if you make them build more farms, they get even more angry. So instead, to try and avoid that, you can just build farms constantly to try and preempt anything happening to drop the food supply down, but then that also makes them just as angry. What I'm saying is, the people in this game need to accept that they do have to work for food sometimes. It doesn't just grow on trees- oh god damn it. Anyway, because of this system where you're building inside and outside the town, there's enough to this building system that you can keep building your nation long after the initial strategic building choices that mark the early death of building mechanics in Total War, but just not quite in the cocaine rush building addict fashion of Civ. It might not be the best of both worlds, but it's a very good combination of both worlds that I can get on board with. And the Cocainum approach actually may not have worked here anyway as it does in Civ, since despite this game basically being Civ, the fact it expands on the military system so much compared to its inspiration means that building things isn't like the only thing you're doing, and not being distracted by constantly building things you don't really need can be considered an upside. And there's a natural balance, in that having a military costs so much money that you won't be building things during wars, then in peace there's nothing to do but build, and nicely you have the money again to do it. Yin Yang designs score bonus, I say. 
But also, it may be worth adding that if you get to the late game with a big empire and you manage to get loads of money, i.e. you convince everyone else to not attack you so you can not be at war, there are lots of buildings to unlock that allow you to go into something like the Civ building frenzy where you get addicted to ending turns, so you can get that somewhere in the game if you really want. So as for what the building system does, you know, you make walls to die slower, you make a barracks to get units, you make a thin making place to get money, it's what you'd expect. Enough about buildings, let's talk about the game's main differentiator to Civ, the fighting system. No? Oh wait, Devin's got something else to go insane over first. The technology system. In Civ games, you research tech from a tech tree, right? But in Total War, you usually research it from two tech trees. How about that, Sid Meier's feeling upstaged? Well, in Oriental Empires, they just went and kicked down your door wielding a quadruple barreled shotgun where all barrels can fire at the same time. I'm seeing double here. Eight tech trees! Yes, you can research four things at once from four different tech trees. I guess it's not quite as exciting as a quadruple barrel shotgun. It's more like a public toilet where there are four sinks next to each other. Well, maybe it's a bit more exciting than that. Look, I don't get paid to come up with the accurate analogies, okay? This design is hitting the sieve groove of allowing there to be new developments always up and coming, since while one tree might need a while to research something big, the others will give you something smaller or unlock something in the meantime. On paper, I think this could be a better tech system than the Civ standard for this reason, but there are two problems holding it back. The first is down to that aforementioned trouble with having to be stingy on the buildings and units. It means unlocking new entries in these categories doesn't provide an immediate benefit most of the time, so there's a bit of a delayed high going on there. But we can live with that though, we're adults. But you know what we aren't? Microscopes. A bold claim, but I can prove it. It's time to activate Super UI Nerd Mode and start complaining about some UI decisions. That, being an enormous loser who scrutinizes UI design in everything, dominated my thoughts while playing the game. I went easy on that building menu before, but look, why are some of the details kept in hidden parts of the menu? Can't that stuff be like, on the screen? Maybe in all the empty space? Somewhere? It's one of these things where I guess they didn't want to cover up too much of the background, but you've already gone ahead and covered up the middle of it, so clearly you didn't expect people to be actually playing the game with this menu open. So just cover everything to minimise clicks and make our lives easy. It's easier to develop, too. In the tech screen, they went there, they went further and just put a picture over the whole background. So clearly it indicates that this menu is to be used entirely separately from the main game. But even then, it still doesn't fill the screen with the stuff, and it suffers because of it. Firstly, the lines that indicate which texts require each other are really close together and could use some highlights of something when relevant things are selected. It basically, making everything spaced out would probably help this out quite a lot. And more importantly, you know what the number two most important thing to making a technology system fun is, after the text being useful? It's counting down to tell the player when they get the new thing. In Oriental Empires, these numbers are the smallest UI elements in the known universe, and you can only see them on the tech menu, which you have to stop playing the game to view. They almost couldn't have done anything more to put tech progression out of the mind of the player. These numbers should be giant. They should be slap bang on the main interface all the time, like in Civ. And while we're here, on the main interface, you know what the two long-term variables you need to manage while playing are? I'll give you a clue. It's the ones the UI design goes out of its way to imply are not in any way significant. You see these tiny numbers in the corner? They're culture and authority. Culture makes people happy, it increases your trade income sometimes, and there's a cultural victory condition like in Civ and authority limits how many settlements you can have without risking uprisings, kind of like happiness in Civ V. These are central to the whole game, but for some reason they only take up one nano percent of their UI panel, so the UI not only still obscures the camera a bit, but it's almost all just a static decoration. Make the variables bigger, damn it! I'm so triggered by this I should be institutionalized! 
And the intern button is too small. There, I said it. What was I talking about? The tech system. Yeah, it's pretty good. If you can find it. The battle system. This battle system is a strange beast. The battles take place on the hex grid, like in Civ, and the result is determined automatically, like in Civ. But in a vast improvement to Civ's literally the worst battle system design ever, you can at least watch the units fight if you want, see some tactics being used, and build a little tension for seeing the eventual result. The most important thing to bring up is that battles are cutscenes rather than gameplay, strictly speaking. You even get letterboxing during battles to hammer that home. The way you play the battle is to set the AI of your units before it starts between some presets. So you might have one unit of your group charge in, another outflank or do skirmishing tactics, that kind of thing. Although what each one actually does requires a lot of trial and error experience, I found. And by the late game, I basically just left everything on default attack enemies mode and that did all the business just fine. Total War veterans will have no problem working out what to do with each unit type, of course, but perhaps, like me, they'll also be frustrated when you're there watching the little battle cutscene things and they tend not to proceed as you imagined, and in some cases the AI just throws everything out the window for one or both sides with random or nonsensical moves, including doing nothing at all in one case as well, which just froze the game for a while. The central design theme for this approach seems to be realism and immersion. A real general just tells his officers approximately what to do and then trusts them to succeed, as you do with your units in the game. In that regard, with AI bugs aside, I think this works. A hands-off system can be very tense because the outcomes are so unpredictable and that's exactly the stress of being a real ruler. The big downside is just lack of gameplay. The player doesn't get to use tactics or defeat the enemy by their own guile, so that avenue for fun and satisfaction is mostly closed. It was a surprise for me actually, as the only thing I knew about this game before coming into it was that its programmer and director also directed Medieval 2 Total War. I think what I'll do here, from the comfort of my backseat, is to say that battles really should have allowed the player to at least change the AI profiles of the units during the fight, so they could try to avoid mess ups and exploit emerging situations. Adding some active gameplay and player agency to this key part of the game, while still keeping the random hands off elements to some extent, since you still don't know exactly what the AI will end up doing with the vague instructions you're giving it. I saw in an interview somewhere that the developer's reason for not allowing control of battles was that many would be too one-sided to require it or to bother with, and that due to the game's system of simultaneous turns, lots of battles could be happening at the same time. Now for that first reason, I don't necessarily buy it, since even though there are billions of fights which you don't need to pay any attention to, having the option to micro fights to avoid losses could be nice even if they're really easy, since getting lost men back is a real pain and more fights might be about to come up on the horizon. For the second reason, I don't know, I feel like it's on the player to avoid having to fight multiple decisive battles at once, just like a real ruler or commander. The divided attention would feed into the same realism theme as not having direct control over all the fine details. Since all battles are effectively order resolves, the optimal way to play the game is to ignore the battles and to just skip to the results using the fast forward button since that's all you need to know gameplay wise, and I think that is a bit of a shame. Also. In this sort of thing, you do have to try and dodge the classic game design pitfall of taking something away from the player without it being clear why. Frustration in games is caused by the player not knowing why they failed, or how they could have avoided failing. The game could be ruined by just the result of a single battle in principle, so the player needs to not feel that the game itself decided to give them a loss by having the AI's timing and battle be way off or whatever. All that said, given that this game is at its core a Civ game, the battle system and military side of things in general is a monumental improvement over the standard set by the giant budgeted predecessors it competes with. So commendations must be given here for adding depth when many fans would have tolerated there being virtually no battle mechanics at all. And if there is an Oriental Empires 2, keep going from here, there's plenty more that could be done to suck in that big money total war crowd 
and make the game better for it. Diplomacy! Remember Diplomacy from Civ? It's back! In China! It's gonna have the same weirdness as most grand strategy diplomacy systems, but it works. I didn't really use it much, since I didn't play it all that much. But you know what to expect. You spend money to get your neighbours to reveal themselves to you, or perhaps even be your special friend, just like in real life. The Presentation For such a small team, the presentation of this game is surprisingly high quality. It's clear that while only a couple of people worked on this, their decades of industry experience allowed them to put something very complete together. Aside from the UI for ants, all the art assets are nice and on theme, and the texture work and animations stand up to the AAA competition for grand strategy games easily. I suppose you could criticise the music for being a little generic, but it's appropriately directed. With everything technically sound, you can only really be turned off by the tone of it. Personally, I'd like something less backgroundy and more paced and aspirational and sweeping. It would make the whole determine the destiny of your people angle of the game's theme come across more powerfully. Likewise, the battle themes could be heavier and more intense to get the fighting mood going. Recent Total War games get these same criticisms from me, by the way. If people could just go ahead and take the musical direction of the Nobunaga's Ambition series and use it on our droning Western strategy games, that would be just great. Just a polite request, guys. I'll just write a little note and put it on your desk, okay? And I'll email you later too. Yeah, thanks guys. That's great. Don't, don't, you know, don't mess it up. Okay, let's do lunch. Keep in touch. The sound effect design is quite dull, especially in battles. Not very immersive or anything, but it blows Civ out of the water, of course, still. Then again, there aren't any lines read by Leonard Nimoy. Or any lines read by anyone, since it's all quite a low-budget affair. Just see if you can get an audiobook with Nimoy or Sean Bean reading, and then put it on while you play, and those Civ fat cats with their bourgeoisie budgets won't stand a chance. The general graphics are just what they need to be. You spend most of the game just looking at a map, and I'll admit it could be more colourful and whatnot, but according to game development tycoon, history and strategy is a great combination and graphics are not important for this type of game, so I have no choice but to give it a pass, and tell Total War Warhammer's dev team that they clearly have got their priorities wrong. The Verdict I'm tired of ranting now, so here's my summative review of the game, in case you needed one. Do you want to play a Civ game with a focused theme and mechanical alterations to make the game better suit that theme and provide a deeper gameplay loop while at war? Maybe you do, but I bet you'd want to play it more if the UI wasn't haunting your nightmares, and by that I mean my nightmares, and perhaps even more if the game pushed a little harder to see those reward cycles in a more important light. It's a competent, surprisingly complete, and in places, superior Civ game. The treatment of war blows Civ out of the water, and did I mention, you get FOUR TECH TREES! But, it's less user-friendly, more willing to ruin the player's plans at random, and more limited on the nation-building side of things. Recommended for open-minded fans of the Civ games, especially if you're into historic military strategy games. Reviewed! Right, I haven't really gone into any of the details here, or the balance, or the multiplayer, because I'm just not that deep in the game myself. I don't even know why I made a review for a game I've barely played, but I have to play so much damn Total War each week that this is just the level of professional journalistic research available. Okay? I just think it's fun to compare the mechanics of things. But then again, as I already mentioned, I am 
an enormous loser. Oriental Empires is out now, but it's not free, so try to work out if you like it first, eh? It's an expensive indie game as they go, but strategy games tend to get away with it since in theory you can get a heck of a lot of playtime out of it, even if the presentation quality isn't through the roof. So thanks for watching, and all that. Usual links to other corners of my internet empire are in the description. I've been your unlicensed and unpaid game design consultant, Offie D, and I'll see you one day for another righteous rant from the backseat of game design.